Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Tree School Online webinar. Um, I'm Mike Clossy, Director of Forestry with the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. And it's my pleasure to be your host this afternoon for today's Tree School Online webinar. Tree School Online is a production of the Oregon State University um, Forestry and Natural Resource Program of the Extension Service and also the Partnership for Forestry Education. I'm gonna give a special shout out to OFRI for leading this project and also to the Oregon Department of Forestry and the US Forest Service for providing us with a grant that covers most of the costs of the show. So Tree School Online is scheduled as a webinar um, every Tuesday um, at 10 a.m. and at 3 p.m. And we're gonna do this until July 28th. Then we're gonna take the month of August off and we'll start back up in September with just two webinars a month on the first and third Tuesdays at 3 p.m. So it's been a success and we wanna continue it. We hope you all wanna continue uh, coming. Um, we do this through Zoom is the software we use. And I just wanna point out a few of the features that we'll be using today because um, they're a little bit different than in other webinars and definitely a little bit different than Zoom meetings. So as participants, you won't have access to your microphone or to your video cameras, but you'll be able to hear us and hopefully see us and see uh, Laura and Michael's PowerPoint. Um, also, you will ask your questions through the Q&A button rather than through the chat button. So on the wet Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen or on an iPad or some other tablets, it's on the top of the screen, um, is the toolbar that has all of the buttons that we use. And there's one for Q&A, you click on that and you can ask your questions. And as the host, I'll be moderating the questions and watching them come in. And uh, we take a Q&A break about the middle and another one at the end to have Michael and Laura answer your questions. We also use polls in here. Um, and that's the, the next button that's over on my screen. You guys probably don't have a button for polls, but when a poll happens, um, it'll pop up on your screen and you answer the questions and then it'll go away. If a poll doesn't pop up on your screen, it's either because you have a pop-up blocker or the, the version of Zoom that you're using lights up a button in the toolbar, then you click on it before it opens. So there's several versions of Zoom out there. Finally, the chat screen or the chat button, chat box, we will use to communicate with you. If you open it now, you'll notice that Glenn Ahrens, who is moderating the, the chat screen, um, has a couple of messages already for you. He'll talk about resources, he'll talk about recordings and that sort of thing. So it should be pretty straightforward. Um, however, if you're having any technical difficulties, that's where you wanna ask them. Uh, we don't wanna ask Michael and Laura to fix your technical stuff, but Glenn's the guy that could do it. Um, other things I wanted you to know about is this webinar will be recorded and the recording will be posted at the address it shows on your screen there, the B slash tree school online, also at knowyourforest.org slash tree school online. Um, they'll be available about a week from now. We'll have that posted. Finally, there are resources available that Michael and Laura put together. And after the show, their PowerPoint slides will be available as a PDF. Those can also be accessed either through the Know Your Forest Tree School Online or the Beebs Tree School Online that Amanda maintains. So it should be pretty straightforward and like to have a lot of information for you. So right now, I'd like to invite uh, Michael and Laura to join us and then I'll introduce them to you. All right, so Michael R. is the uh, forest conservationist at West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, and Laura Taylor is the education coordinator and conservationist also at the West Multnomah SWCD. Um, Michael has been there for 10 years. Um, just a little fun fact, um, I knew Michael when he was a grad student, and I can't believe how long ago that was. We were both much younger then, um, and he was studying um, conservation easements, and it was a real excellent study that he did. So anyway, ask him about conservation easements sometime. He knew a lot then. I assume he hasn't forgotten any of it. 
Um, Michael works with uh, landowners, woodland owners to develop forest stewardship plans that encourage them to have healthy forests, diverse forests, forests control, control invasive species and enhanced wildlife habitat. Laura is a botanist and a plant ecologist. She has a strong interest in relationships between plants and pollinators. Um, she's, as I said, the conservationist and education coordinator at West Multnomah SWCD. She manages and mentors successful restoration projects in forests, meadows, streams, and wetlands. And she also runs the district education program. So uh, we're really happy to have them here today. This is SWCD Day at Tree School Online. We had Randy Schiffel from Tualatin here this morning. Welcome, both of you. Tell us about what you're going to tell us about. All right, thanks. Let's see if I can make the thing work. <laughs> Cool. All right. So we're going to be talking about the managing beneficial understory vegetation in your woodlands. All right. So before we kick it off to you guys, um, we do have a poll, as I promised. And on these polls, what we do is we ask questions about who you are. But that's not the right one. Skip that. Sorry. End polling. Let's do the first one first and the last one last. Okay, here is the first poll. So, where are you from? Well, I'm at Valley Coast, Southwest Oregon, Central or Eastern Oregon, Washington State, USA, or outside the USA. So, give us your answer there um, about yourself. Are you a woodland owner? Multiple, sorry, these are multiple answers. Private natural resource professional, agency natural resource professional, nonprofit natural resource professional, or others. How many acres of forest land do you own or manage? And finally, this one is a special one from Michael and Laura. Which of the following activities do you participate in on your woodlands? Controlling invasive weeds, thinning trees for wider spacing, planting shrubs, planting forbs or wildflowers, adding wildlife enhancements such as birdhouses, brush piles, creating snags, or none of the above. So we'll wait a couple minutes. Generally about 80% of the people vote and it takes about a minute. So we're approaching a minute and we're at 72%. So if three more people vote, we will end polling. So get your vote in now. And we've reached the magic number of 80%. So now we will post the results. Hold on, too many buttons on my screen pop up at once. So this is what you said. 75% are from the Willamette Valley, a smattering from the coast, southwest, central, um, a bunch from Washington State, a couple from other parts of the US and nobody from outside. You're mostly woodland owners, 65%, but also some natural resource professionals, especially heavy to the agency and the other. And people own an equal amount between 10 or less and 10 to 40. So this is a little smaller crowd than we've had, but not a lot. And then for your special questions, people want to control invasive weeds. Yeah, we want that. They want to thin their trees. They want to plant shrubs. They want to do everything. This sounds like our kind of audience. So I will turn it over to Michael. I think he goes first and uh, start her up and I will, I will go silent. The crowd says yes. All right. Let me see if I can get this to work okay. So I actually just got my slideshow. Let's try this. I think we're all right. Okay. So, um, all right. Well, thanks for that great introduction, Mike. Um, I thought that in my first slide here, I would just... Um, talk a little bit about what a soil and water conservation district is before I um, launch into the real content that you guys all came here for. Thanks everyone for joining us. It's really neat to know that we put this together and have 62 people um, listening. So um, at Tree School each year, and I think I've, I have taught at the last nine of these now, um, I usually ask the question of who knows what a soil and water conservation district is, or even probably what I say is who's worked with them before. And uh, over the years, I think that more and more hands go up to where last year, I'm pretty sure it was more than half of the audience, which is really great. 
Um, but for those of you that don't know, soil and water conservation districts exist all across the country, and they typically serve a geographical boundary that is uh, e it's equal to the county boundary of the county that they are within. So like Clackamas SWCD covers Clackamas County, um, so it's pretty straightforward. And we work with people on voluntary conservation. So um, sometimes that might be helping a farmer use water more efficiently, which is beneficial to them and to the greater society by just having you know more efficiency with water because we do sometimes have water quantity issues. Um, and all this, and then, then there's a lot of variation though, I'm kind of skipping down to some of these bullets below, but in the metro area around Portland and Northwest Oregon, you'll see a pretty robust conservation districts that work with people for on farms, like I just mentioned, but also forests, streams, urban projects, um, and really robust invasive species programs at most of the districts in this region of the state too. Um, so yeah, so we might work with a farmer, but we might also help someone just get rid of English ivy in their forest or something like that. Um, so it's always voluntary. It's not a, we're not regulatory, which is really great. And we often can um, offer technical, always, I guess, just about for most things can offer technical assistance, but financial assistance is also sometimes an option. So um, you'll see, I think, where the project that uh, we're going to talk about fits pretty well into those goals. Keep on. Um, So I just want to outline what I'm going to talk about um, or what we will talk about today. So I'll just talk a little bit about understory related to forest health and why we think that people need understory in a lot of situations or and when I say understory, I'm talking about the plants that are growing on the ground below your trees and that might be little tiny wildflowers or even shrubs that are 30 feet tall. So we're kind of talking about that range of our forest today. You can kind of see that in the diagram here on the right. This lower stuff is kind of what we're covering. Um, and then Laura's going to really hit you guys with a lot of the really great facts about some of the work that we've been doing at our district about planting and seeding these areas. And then at the end, I want to wrap it up by talking about a few other forest floor features and then summarize things through um, some examples and options of ways people can get started on some of these projects. Um, so we'll launch in here. Okay. I think I'm just getting a slight time lag, so bear with me. And okay, I think if I'm just more patient with the next one, well, Yeah, give it about 20 seconds or so, Michael, after you click it, if it doesn't come up and maybe try to anticipate your next slide. Okay. I'm going to try to go back to that other one, but it, I'll start talking about it anyway, because if you don't see it, it's not the end of the world on this one. Um, I think a lot of times when we think about forest health in the Pacific Northwest, we think about three really big things that always seem to be associated with it. And that can be wildfire, like you see in the image down here on the left. Um, there's a lot of things we can do to protect our forests and make them healthier and maybe more resilient if wildfire comes our way. Um, then we also have uh, insect damage, which is a common thing. So we might have Douglas fir beetles, uh, this, you know, I think that's a fur engraver we have a photo of there as far as the galleries, but the green insect is an emerald ash borer, something we're trying to be prepared for because it may show up in Oregon at some point. Um, and then also you see some yellow trees in this one hillside and that might be some disease that's in the forest. But um, at the conservation district, when we work with woodland owners, we're definitely adding some other layers to the forest health question. Um, we really think that, and we see this with a lot of landowners, that they're really interested in, um, you know, wildlife habitat and um, some of these. Uh, and so I think a part of it, having a healthy forest would be to um, make sure that you've got some cover for wildlife and also some food for them, which you would see in my next image. I'm going to try a different button here. Because Mike, I've been using the arrows and they have been working, but now they're not. Okay, why don't we try to have Laura advance the slide? 
There we go. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, yeah, so you know, you see a deer eating some um, some salal berries in this picture, and that's really part of a healthy forest. We often want to support wildlife. Um, you know, we're the soil and water conservation district, so we love to see healthy soils, of course, too. And sometimes soils can be heavily related on just the underlying geology of the site. We might have thin soils in some areas that might make our trees grow slower and we can't do a lot about it. But there are sometimes things that you can do to improve soil. And so having a lot of organic matter in that soil can really lead to sometimes better tree growth, but also like really robust um, uh, understory vegetation. So we like to see kind of diverse um, leaves, I guess, breaking down in that soil and really kind of adding different nutrients. Um, and then the picture I have on the bottom is a um, just aesthetics. You know, a lot of people want to see a lot of diversity in the stand. And um, in this picture, it's kind of a later fall picture. You're not seeing a lot of pink and white flowers or anything like that, but you are seeing a little bit of fall color if you zoom in a bit. So that's a pretty felt, uh, excuse me, healthy understory. So go ahead and advance. And so this is just kind of a broad forest ecosystem health definition that we define it in terms of ecosystem stability and resilience in response to a disturbance or stress. So um, I think a lot of times when we have an inta intact understory that actually does add resilience to invasive species pressures and some other things that might happen um, in our forests. We can go to the next one. So I'm going to do four slides coming up here where I'll talk about each of these things you see here. I'm going to talk a little bit about how forest understory might help with erosion, how it might help with invasive weed control or be like a part of the uh, solution. And then just um, talking a little bit about bare ground and lack of habitat and also um, aesthetics. So we can go to the next one. So a lot of times in our forest, we have um, unstable slopes or just slopes that would be unstable, except for thankfully we have a lot of trees and shrubs and those can really kind of hold a slope together quite a bit. Um, sometimes the trees and the shrubs are doing the job. Sometimes herbaceous material can be really helpful to just help, uh, assist with that surface erosion issue. And so um, in this photo that I have on the screen right here, this was an area where if you would have looked down upon it before a little landslide occurred that you can, I think, pick out in this image, um, you would have seen, you know, maybe 100 trees per acre kind of density on the hillside and some shrubs, but not necessarily a ton of them. But, um, and sometimes we just have ravines, especially in the West Hills on the si outside of Portland that are just, um, these little landslides can happen quite a bit. I think it's kind of a little bit of a soil thing. But the one thing is when they do happen, it can be great to come in with some grass seed or some shrubs that might be shade tolerant that you can plant into these sites because those will help reduce further erosion. So if you look at this, you know, you could envision rainfall making more and more of the topsoil wash away from this. But on this particular project, we added some shrubs and um, some other things that are on the next slide, Laura, that, um, that you can see coming in. So we helped this landowner Put this is a thing you see in the middle is called a straw waddle, and you see these on construction projects when you're driving down the road sometimes, like on highway projects. But also, um, I can pick out kind of in this area a shrub that was planted, another one here, and then this is either blue wild rye. I'm almost sure it's actually blue wild rye that was planted here too, which is a fairly affordable plant that you can throw in the understory and it'll grow and reduce erosion. Next slide, Laura. So um, this, this slide's really, I would say, what probably most brought us to thinking more uh, formally about understory management was that we were, and, and really this speaks for like the whole metro region because a lot of ecologists have talked about this and over the years in Portland. Um, we have a lot of times where we remove invasive weeds. We're known for our ivy in Portland. And you can see a couple of volunteers on the picture there on the left that are, that are pulling ivy. Uh, but you also see a lot of bare soil showing up. So my top two photos with that smiley face would be uh, oak toothwort or cardamony um, is the genus of that one. And then there's a trillium. And when those guys pop up, when we've removed ivy, that's great. Those are really awesome wildflowers. And sometimes they're just hidden under the ivy ready to pop, pop up and take over. But there's oftentimes parts of the year where we still have bare soil or we just don't get the natives to pop up. And we sometimes get some of the bad guys to show up. So we did all this work to get rid of ivy, but maybe we just have herb robber and shiny geranium or garlic mustard or things like that that come in 
instead. And then these two photos that I have at the bottom with the frown face is um, shiny geranium on the left and herb robert on the right. So throwing down native seed can really help to kind of occupy the site. And, and again, that's where we really got interested in, the, in doing more of a project that Laura will talk about. So next slide. So um, I, I have a degree in wildlife biology and I love when I walk into forests to think about something that I learned and I, you know, one of the first classes I took, which was that wildlife really need food, water, cover and space. And you can add to this list, like I like to add connectivity to it. You know, if you have great habitat, but it's only a half acre, that's not gonna help some wildlife very much, whereas other wildlife, it might help a lot. So the picture on our left is a great stand of Douglas fir. Um, it looks like it's a little dense, maybe it could use some thinning, but if someone's trying to grow saw logs and just do some logging in the future, and they're really um, thinking about economics, you know, that's definitely a great stand of Douglas fir that's coming in there. But if you look down at the forest floor there, it's pretty, it's pretty sparse. In the foreground, there's some ferns, but looking further back, there's really not a lot grown on the forest floor there. So if you think about wildlife that might use a forest that looks like that, there's going to be limitations on what there is to eat. So you don't have much of a food resource. And for smaller animals, they may not feel like they really have that great of cover because if they're moving through that forest without many ferns and fringe cup and things like that to sneak under or down wood, um, then that's a pretty exposed site. So there's limitations for wildlife in that stand. Now, a lot of you may have, you know, 12 acres that look like that, but then you also have 12 acres or 10 acres that are maple and all these other things. And, and so it's, it's definitely okay to have stands that look like this and, and, and wildlife can often go next door or go to your other part of your forest to get what they need. Um, but some folks, you know, they have 40 acres and it all looks like this and they want to do things with the understory. And that's something that we find a lot with uh, landowners around Portland. Um, so you go to the right, that's kind of an extreme example. Now I'm seeing probably alder, maple, Douglas fir, and cedar all in that stand. I see salmonberry in the foreground, a bunch of different kinds of ferns. There's probably Indian plum and ocean spray in there and red huckleberry. So that's a really diverse forest. So that's got, that's, it's kind of got something for everyone there. You know, there's big trees, middle-sized trees, small trees, and things like that. So a lot of landowners may realize they're not going to, it's not that easy to get all the way to that picture on the right, but they want to go a little closer to it because they enjoy the, uh, the benefits. Oh, I just hit the button myself and it worked. Um, that's good. And then just aesthetics, you know, a lot of people, um, they enjoy walking around their forest and they want to see different colors, whether that be fall colors or whether that be um, different colored um, flowers that are growing in the forest and that kind of thing. And I was thinking about this one a little bit today and I was thinking about some of my favorite hikes when I just go do recreation, I go up towards Mount Hood and hike or something like that. And I mean, I love old growth. I love really big trees, but I'm often more drawn to go back to the areas that had really great understory. There's a lot of people that like to do wildflower hikes up um, on salmon, the Salmon River corridor, things like that. And so understory really is a draw for people. And um, sometimes it's fun to throw out some statistics. And I like to every few years look at the USDA Forest Service's National Woodland Owner Survey results, something that's done, I think, every five years or so. Um, and it'll poll people all across the country. These are kind of fun stats to look at. Um, but I zoomed in just to Oregon and looked up at some things. And these are all folks with 10 plus acres. And it turns out that 58% of ownerships, which is more than 2 million acres, report that they will be working on invasive weed control um, or, or have done that in the next five years or will do that in the next five years. Um, and that, that actually kind of matches up pretty well with the poll that was taken here uh, today as we got started. Um, and then also we see about 66% of these owners cite motivation to protect or improve wildlife habitat and 70% aim to protect nature or biological diversity. So again, we really see a lot of interest in this kind of work and um, really motivated us to um, look at it a little bit closer so we could give cool presentations like this at Tree School. And then I think this is where I hand it off to Laura. Hello, thanks. For that, Michael, um, I'm going to try holding my speaker here so that people can hear me. Um, yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, getting into biodiversity, uh, I feel like that's a great segue to start talking about our project, which is where we were really 
um, looking at replacing these monocultures of invasive weeds like ivy or garlic mustard, um, blackberry, uh, with a more diverse set of, of native plants in the understory. Um, and this project was kind of inspired by this local partnership that sprang up um, called the Understory Species Increase Project. Um, this is a partnership between a couple local agencies, including Metro, the Portland Bureau of Environmental Services, and Clean Water Services. Um, and, you know, all of these uh, agencies work on controlling invasive plants in forest understory and notice this problem of, you know, you replace one weed with another, like what good did that do? Um, and we want ideally to get back to that really diverse, rich uh, forest understory that Michael has been, uh, you know, drumming up. Uh, so uh, a couple years ago, Michael and, and I were awarded an NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant, um, and that enabled us to kind of join this partnership and participate in this study. Uh, and we kind of focused our little study here in the Tualatin watershed side of the Multnomah County District, uh, because that kind of overlaps with all of these other partners' jurisdictions. Let's see if I can make it go. There we go. So with our project, we had a couple big questions. Uh, first of all, you know, how effective uh, can we, how effective can we be at establishing this native understory from seed? Uh, because seed is just a, if it works, can be a much more um, cost-effective way of planting lots of plants out on the, the landscape. Uh, but, you know, we had had kind of mixed success in the past. Sometimes it seemed to work well. Other times, uh, you know, you spend all this money on seed and you put it out and you don't really see very much for it. And so we wanted to drill into why that was. Uh, and of the species we tested, which of them perform best? And that can really... Uh, performance, you know, we kind of broke that down into a couple different um, metrics, you know, first just uh, how well do things germinate, and then second, how well do they grow and, and take in space or take up space. And then um, finally, uh, getting even more specific, uh, are there different species that do better in different kinds of conditions? You know, and there's so many different conditions that you can look at. Um, you know, like coniferous versus deciduous forest, what kind of soil, uh, all kinds of things, but we wanted to see what those associations might be uh, if there were any. Um, so our approach was pretty straightforward. You know, we had to find sites on private property where, you know, that's, that's where we work. So find some landowners who were interested in what we were doing and had the conditions that we were uh, interested in, such as a forest invaded by some invasive species in our experimental area. And then we set up experimental plots and um, went through the whole routine of doing our uh, weed removal and uh, seeding and then observing what happens. Uh, so that, you know, this, we're going to get a little sciencey here. Um, this is, we definitely tried to keep this uh, a scientific study so we could look at uh, results in a rigorous way. So we set up, uh, we chose eight sites and you can see they, they had a range of different weed issues. Some had ivy and vinca, some had um, blackberry. A few had just very dense forests that needed to be thinned. Um, one of them had both issues of uh, needing some thinning and it had blackberry. Um, and then within each site, we set up six plots and uh, we had, we broke those into three different types of treatments, right? So one, we, we raked away the, um, the leaves and the duff, uh, but then we didn't seed it. That was kind of our control. In, in a second treatment type, we had um, 
the raking, but then we seeded it with a diverse mix of uh, these understory plants. And then in a third treatment type, um, we didn't rake and we seeded a simpler mix because uh, we knew that that probably wouldn't work as well. So we didn't want to spend a huge amount of resources on that. But practically speaking, you know, we don't expect to uh, feasibly go out and rake an entire forest to establish forest understory. So we wanted to know, well, how well will it work without that raking? So this is kind of what our an individual plot looked like. Um, and, you know, we had six of these at each of our eight sites. So we had a, a circular plot with a, an 11 foot diameter. And, um, you know, we seeded that whole area, did the, the raking and all that. But then we really did um, detailed uh, inventories of all the plants that came up in these little uh, square subplots, and we had four of those around each plot, one at each uh, sort of cardinal direction. Um, we also sort of took into account these this plant species that were in our seed mix that might be growing around each plot because we wanted to control for if those things were adding additional seeds to our plots. And um, so basically at each of these plots we we took measurements four different times. One time as a baseline before we did anything, and that was in um, June of 2018. And then uh, last year in 2019, we went out there twice, once in April, um, and that was to kind of see what was just coming in, just sort of germinating. And then again in June to kind of see like what a, a good full sort of spring season of growth might look like. And then we, we went back again this year in May to kind of see what a, a second year of growth looked like. So this is the list of species that we, that we saw, um, or that we seeded, sorry. Um, there's, you know, a lot of the kind of common forest uh, floor understory plants that you might see if you go out for a hike in a nice place or out in your woodlands. Uh, you know, things like fringe cup, water leaf. Um, let's see, um, you know, Siberian miner's lettuce, uh, large leaved avens, piggyback plant. Um, Pathfinder. And um, so, you know, we seeded all of these except the organ facilia, which is this plant um, on the bottom uh, right <laughs> um, in our diverse mix. And then the one, the four plants with stars, we seeded in the unraked plots. Let's see. So, yeah, it's a good mix. It gave us lots to work with. Uh, you can see here, this is just a, a look at what one of our plots looked like before we raked and then after we raked. Um, just kind of removed all of that, um, you know, branches and pine needle duff, or if it was a more deciduous forest, like all of the, the leaves. And um, it's just, you know, it's very commonly known in agriculture and in all kinds of scenarios that like good soil contact is very important for seeds to germinate. Um, so, you know, we wanted to, uh, you know, do that so that we had a better chance of success. And this is uh, one of our past interns, Ari, helping out, um, helping with the raking, and then uh, we would seed all this nice diverse little mix we have in the baggie. Um, and then, you know, after a year, we got to come back and uh, check out the, the, the growth and see what had happened. Um, and so this is just some, some live shots of our monitoring. You know, we had our little subplots. Uh, this year we were entering data all digitally, so we didn't have to exchange devices. Uh, we really got to know uh, 
in great detail what tiny seedlings uh, look like uh, of different species, um, even very similar looking species such as on the, the left, the fringe cup and large leaf avens. <laughs> um, it's where that botany degree really comes in handy, I guess. All right, and then, you know, just getting at some preliminary results. Um, and what I'm going to be sharing with you today is really, uh, it's the first year's data from 2019. Uh, while we have our 2020 data now, we haven't really uh, had time to, to, you know, graph it all out and do the analysis yet. Um, but first, just like kind of some general broad brush, what things looked like. Um, so starting with our raked and seeded plots, uh, and I'm going to start with a blackberry removal um, deciduous forest type um, example. Um, so, you know, it was just really surprising how, uh, how great things worked out. You know, like I say, sometimes we seed and we cross our fingers and <laughs> We don't know what's going to happen, but sure enough, you know, we we went from that in the top there, just a sort of bare thicket of dead blackberry canes to just this circle of diverse native plant species. And um, you can see in the bottom two, that's from April 2019 to June 2019. Um, things really grew very quickly. Um, this particular site, we thinned and removed the blackberries, so, you know, they really had a good shot with lots of light and good resources. Um, going on to some, uh, the same treatment, the raked and seeded plots, but with uh, vincia and ivy removal and generally in a more um, coniferous forest setting. Um, also really good results, you know, the same thing. We went from just like these monocultures of weeds to uh, diverse little pools of of native plants and I know you can't like get in there and see which species they are but within the plots there are definitely some uh, native lots of native plants um, this is an interesting site up on the top uh, right that area didn't have as much pressure from introduced um, plants. So, you know, outside of our plot, there just wasn't a lot coming in. But then at the bottom right picture, this was a site where within our circle of where we seeded, it was primarily like the native water leaf, sweet sicily, all that kind of stuff. But then you can kind of see in the foreground, um, there's these taller plants, and that's the introduced wall lettuce that was at that site. And so you, it would be just striking. You would see native plants inside our plot and then right around it, a bunch of uh, non-native kind of like annual weedy things. Um, and so, yeah, I would say a gestalt is that it worked. <laughs> um, here's some uh, contrasts with our uh, unraked, or sorry, the, the raked but unseeded plots. So um, here we, we did have that disturbance of raking. So we kind of removed a mulch layer that might act as kind of a weed barrier. And then we didn't seed anything. And, um, you know, there's a lot going on here. So this square on the, the top left is uh, before in the sort of inset with the, the vinca and then after. And um, it's basically uh, herb robber and wall lettuce inside of our plot. Um, over on the top right, you can see the before is some mix of ivy and trillium. And then in the after photo two years later, there really wasn't a lot of uh, introduced things coming back. Luckily, it was more trillium and things like that. Um, but still mostly bare where the ivy had been. And then on these bottom two photos, you see um, uh, year one, then going into year two. And, you know, the first year things hadn't really filled in yet, but it, sure enough, a year later, there's, I'm seeing a lot of like that woodland ground soil, thistles, things like that. It was kind of a mix. Okay, then our last 
um, treatment type, this was the unraked and seeded plots. So we didn't move, remove the leaf litter, or the duff, um, but we did spread some native seed. And here it was a, a different story for the more deciduous forests that tended to have the blackberry removal issue. Um, there we did find some more success, although things were kind of uh, patchy. Like you'd find a whole clump of, you know, maybe 20 little seedlings all in one spot. Um, but yeah, we had decent success with our natives coming in there. I think probably because there was more light, maybe something to do with the soil. Um, but then in the uh, more dug for thinning forest or forest thinning projects, um, yeah, we created a little more light, a few more things were coming in, but it really wasn't that same dramatic shift from no plants to plants. Okay, so because this was a, a science study, we get to look at some data. <laughs> um, and I, I personally love data because, yeah, you can look at a bunch of pictures and be like, I don't know, there might be a pattern, but you look at stuff like this and you're like, yeah, wow, there's a pattern. Um, so we'll focus first on the left graph. Um, so this is just looking at how many plants came up per square meter in these different treatment types. And the major thing that stands out is that our plots where we raked and seeded had way more native plants. Now this could have been all water leaf, like there could have been 300 water leaf per square meter and nothing else, right? So it doesn't really show you the whole story, but in terms of just the sheer number of plants that came in, it was way more natives um, than, um, so that's the green bar is native and then blue is just exotic, but not necessarily like super invasive. Yellow is the invasive things that would be like blackberry ivy, the really bad plants that can change ecosystems. Um, gray are just things that were kind of too small to identify. Um, so very striking. And one thing I think, so there's that interesting thing that the, the raked and seeded plots had many more native plants. Also, the raked and seeded plots had more native plants than the raked and control plots, but total number of plants was about the same for those two but there was just a larger percentage of uh, native plants in the um, seeded unraked plots. Okay, so then moving over to our right graph and the plant diversity. Um, so this is now looking at the, the cumulative number of species that we found in these different types of treatments, um, you know, and that's really getting at how, how many different kinds of wildlife can we support? How beautiful is it? Because we generally find diversity beautiful. Um, and you can see again, green is native and the raked control and raked seeded kind of had about the same numbers of species of natives, exotics, etc. cetera. Um, the unraked plots had fewer uh, number of species. They were a little less diverse. Um, and that's probably just because the, the, you know, duff or the leaves were basically suppressing plants from coming in. All right, so then another question, which plants did best? So get, starting with the first sort of uh, metric for that, which plants germinated well? Uh, so to answer that, basically, we're looking at each of our uh, planted species, which is um, all these plants listed here. And we compared the sort of seeding rate that those that species uh, existed in our seed mix to the percentage of those species that emerged, right? So you can think about that. If, if all of the species did equally well, the um, green and brown bars would be the same. If, uh, if a plant um, basically had a very high germination rate, then the green bar, which is the number of plants that emerged of that species, will be much larger than the, the brown bar. 
and vice versa. If the green bar is really short compared to the brown bar, then that species didn't necessarily um, have a very efficient germination rate. So based on that, we can just look for where were all of the uh, really long green bars compared to brown and inside out flower, um, small flowered nemophila, which is a little like trailing ground cover, miner's lettuce, all the plants with these yellow stars, they get a gold star for germination. Um, so yeah, those, that's part of that answer. Um, these aren't necessarily the plants that grew the biggest, fastest. So, you know, it's just one piece of the puzzle, but we do know, you know, like basically you don't necessarily have to buy as much seed of these particular species because they're generally pretty efficient at germinating. And on to our last graph, I promise. Um, I know this one's even more uh, dizzying, but we'll break it down. Uh, basically, we're looking here at did different species do well in different types of forests or treatment types? So here, um, each color represents a different uh, forest sort of uh, treatment type. So if it had ivy or vinca removal, it's green, purple or yeah, kind of purple is blackberry removal, and the blue is thinning. Um, and we're just looking at how many plants um, were growing. Ignore the, the uh, seeding rate thing. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, if something did better in one of these types of forests, it'll have a longer bar than the other. So my overall take from this graph is that generally speaking, these types of uh, forest treatment factors didn't have a very big effect on which plants did well. Overall, these plants pretty much did well no matter what. Um, and there's just a few like variations that are kind of minor. So like, for example, all the plants with these blue stars did a little better in the forest thinning plots. Um, miner's lettuce did better where there was a blackberry removal. Um, small flowered nemophila and the grasses did better in the ivy and vinca removal. See? But yeah, overall I'd say, you know, if you pick shade loving plants like the ones on this list, they'll probably do pretty well. Um, there's a few species that you know, didn't do as well. And I'm thinking, because Siberian miner's lettuce almost always does great um, in my like anecdotal experience. So I think it had more to do with just maybe the seed in this particular batch wasn't very uh, healthy or something. So there's a few unanswered questions left um, that we hope to really get from our 2020 data. And that's more of a, which species grew the fastest to kind of fill in that void. Um, and what were the effects of soil nutrients and um, different soil characteristics. So with that, I think we're gonna take a little break for some questions. All right. Thank you, Laura, this is excellent. Um, let me see if Michael's there too. Michael, turn on your camera if you would in your microphone because some of these are from your part of the show and some are from Laura's. So thank you all for answer, asking such a great question. So this, the first question that came up, you really haven't covered at all, but I think it's a real interesting one. So is it possible to test for large scale previous use of herbicides on downstream watershed properties? That is how to monitor long timber, large timber clear cut understory methods affecting small woodlands below. You guys have any uh, information on that? You know, that's, we did do soil samples on these sites and I think we're gonna get a lot of good info on um, if there was any nutrient that was higher in some soils than others that helped things grow well, like maybe like potassium was high or something like that. Um, one thing that's interesting is looking at our soils data so far, it looks like 
there was not a lot of variation between soils, which there's probably all from like the same parent material with similar forestry history and so forth. But we aren't testing for herbicides in those because I don't think that's, there's not a lot of um, soil analysis um, facilities out there that are doing a lot of that herbicide testing. Like um, we tell farmers to take soil samples into their local place and they're often just looking at some key nutrients we're taking ours to Oregon State University's Central Analytical Lab. So maybe that is something we could have tested for a little bit more, but it wasn't as much what we were looking at. But I'd be curious to know more about it. I'd have the same question that that person asked, I think. It's, it's a good question. And I think we know a lot about the fate of herbicides in water because that's been studied a lot. And we know they go downstream if they get there. But in soil, it really depends on the type of herbicide used and, and what you're doing. And, and one of the tricks is you need like a set, you need to know what you're looking for before, because the tests are, are, are chemical specific. So there's not just like one magic test you can run that shows any chemical. You gotta be looking for atrazine or, or Roundup or whatever is specific. How about you, Laura, any insight on that? I don't have a whole lot. Um... And I, I remember seeing something recently about some, some soil that had been purchased uh, around this area that had caused some really weird plant growth. And I'm, I'm spacing out on the name of the herbicide that they, they I think that's, figured that out. And I think that's so, clopyrrolid, I want to okay. say. So that's an insecticide, right? Yeah, that is yeah. an insecticide. Yeah, so I mean, if you see something really weird, like strange plant growth that's unexplained, um, that could be something to to give you a hint. But otherwise, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. Um, how to create or grow a protective ecotone between our neighbors who may not be doing the best practices and our own woodland and riparian areas that, that we want to keep clear and pure. Ooh. That's a cool idea in general. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking, I, I'm kind of assuming that means protective from, uh, I don't know if it's like herbicide drift or like just invasive weeds coming in. But um, in general, either way, you could just try to plant very densely along that border. And um, that'll acute, you know, that'll kind of catch that drift. And there are certain plants that, at least for herbicide drift, it would be more um, resistant yeah. to those things. For I weeds, I would say like plant just a really dense sort of strip of um, sword fern, because sword fern just it. It's so dark underneath and it's such a dense cover that it's hard for anything else to grow. <laughs> that, right. That'd be just off the top of my head. How about you, Michael? Anything to add to that one? No, I think that was covered well by Laura, actually. Okay. So this next one is about the photo that Michael had of the deer eating salal. The salal is at the deer's shoulder height. And this person, their salal is only ankle height, and they're they're wondering how long is it going to take their salal to grow to that height. You know, I, there's probably people on this this um, call here that would know a lot more about that actually. But what I find with the forests in the West Hills of Portland is that we often get it up to about knee height. I would guess that that deer was eating salal more on the coast where I feel like when I'm out there, it's like at my shoulders. Um, we don't tend to quite get it that tall in our area. Yeah, just the way salal grows, it, it tends to like the drier, rockier sites and there's just not that much available. But as you get deep into the coast, there's even lots available on the drier, rockier sites where salal grows. Yeah. Good. Okay, so this person wants to know where they can find information on native plants and where can they can find the plants. Oh, great question. We're actually, that's the next thing I'll be talking about. So we'll get All to right, that. good. We'll lead into it. So the next question is specifically about the plots that you did, Laura. What month did you seed for, for success? Mm. Oh, great question. Um, we seeded in... I believe it was like late September to early October is when we seeded those plots. And that seemed to work pretty well. Um, yeah. 
But yeah, right. in the fall is really a good time for seeds. So I noticed this is the one question from me as you were doing the plots and there were questions about the plots that you answered. So we didn't have to do this, but you include in the class resources, this uh, understory monitoring guide that talks about how you did the monitoring. Um, how do you envision, do you, do you see that landowners would do this on their own land and, and take some plots and see how they're going? Um, that's a really good question. I think, you know, when you're, if you're going to seed, then it's definitely, you know, of course, a good idea to go out and just look at, you know, you don't have to do like a super detailed uh, inventory of every single seedling out there, um, like we did for science, but, you know, just get a feel for like how well things are coming up. Um, and you know, we include a couple different methods in that resource, and one of them is a much simpler kind of point intersect method where you can just kind of lay out a meter tape and, or a, 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 you know, measuring tape and every foot just, um, you know, have like see what's growing there. And that'll give you a little bit more of a quantitative measure without, you know, spending all day in one little spot. <laughs> And I think the point you made was really valid that when, if we just look at pictures and we look at what we look at as we walk through there, we see a different thing than when we actually have data and can actually say what the percent cover is by species. It's, it's very different, I've noticed in, in my work. Okay, so this is an interesting one. Um, poison oak is a native species, um, but most people want to avoid it and get rid of it. So what is its role? and its value to animals and birds. Mm -hmm. So, That's I mean, great. what I've ahead, always heard with poison oak was that um, the, the berries of it will get eaten by wildlife. Some species uh, will eat those. And I think they're often maybe one that gets kind of eaten a little later when some of the other maybe really good stuff is gone. But it does have a role um, for food, actually. Um, we also, this is a little bit speculative, but we also do sometimes find different nests in our ivy vines, which are vines that we definitely handle more. We get our hands on there and we pull on them and stuff. So nesting in um, poison oak, I would, I would probably make bets that that happens too. It's just a different growth form that some species are gonna like. Um, I wish, I mean, I know a lot of people would love to hear more good reasons if they were going to keep their poison oak around, but that's kind of what I know of. Yeah, I could add to that too. Um, you know, I've seen uh, the when it's flowering, bees are just crazy about it. Um, so, you know, poison oak flowers, we don't notice them because they're not like a big rose or something, but I think they produce a lot of nectar. And um, one other thing I would add is that because people tend to avoid poison oak, um, it can actually play an amazing role for protecting uh, just sensitive habitats, like places where there are like rare wildflowers and things. Um, they're still there because there's poison oak in part, in my opinion. All right, everything has a purpose, right? <laughs> That's right. So one more question before we go back to the presentation because it has directly to do with the plots. Um, when Laura seeded, did you just broadcast and toss the seeds or did you rake them in? How did the, the process go? Mm. Oh yeah, thanks. I, I should have added a little more about all that. But yeah, we, so we, after raking and the soil was all kind of nice and roughed up, we, um, we kind of sort of broadcast with our hands. We didn't use a machine because we had all different shapes and sizes of seeds and it would just wouldn't work out very well. Um, so yeah, we kind of just like let the seeds kind of fall through our fingers. And then I believe we did kind of um, uh, use the rake afterwards to kind of rake them in a little bit and tamp them down a little bit, but um, nothing too uh, labor intensive there. And I would just add that we wanted to do it that way in part because we thought that's how small woodland owners would probably do it. And so it was, so what, you can get those same results, we promise. <laughs> All right. Very good. So back to the show and uh, keep asking questions. It looks like we got seven of them that we didn't get to, but we've got some time at the end. So. All right. 
Cool. Well, I think I have a couple more things to share and then it'll be back to Michael. Yeah, great questions. Thanks, everyone. All right, so now we're going to get into the a little bit more practical how you can enhance your forest floor. Um, so just some basic stuff about how to plant. Um, timing is really super important. And we didn't talk as much about shrubs here, but um, we did also plant shrubs in some of these projects. And uh, we do generally, Michael has a lot of projects where he plants understory shrubs in forests like this. So we often get bare root shrubs um, and they're good to plant in the winter. They need to be dormant, so not have their leaves, not be actively growing. Um, and, you know, we'll order them like in the fall from these nurseries that provide them and then plant them in uh, like January or February. You really don't want to go any later than that because in February you've already got Indian plum leafing out and things are starting to wake up around here. Um, for plugs or containers, you can get, you know, gallon pots of things or smaller plugs. Um, Anytime fall to winter is a good time to plant. And um, it, they're a little bit more forgiving, you know, because they already have soil around their roots. But the longer you wait into the spring, the more you're basically setting them up for um, getting into that summer drought or even spring drought now we have uh, where you know, they're just starting to try to establish and they don't have enough water to really grow. For seed, you definitely want to plant in the fall unless you talk to the person where, who you're ordering the seed from and they, will, they tell you that you can do otherwise. But in general, um, our native plants need to go through a, a cold stratification, basically. So sitting there uh, cold and damp for a certain number of weeks in order to then know that they have gone through winter and it's okay to germinate out in the spring. Um, it's like this, the one person was asking, it's really important to get to know your different plants um, and put the right plant in the right place. Uh, because, you know, certain species are just not going to thrive. Some need it really wet. And if you put them in an upland, they're really going to just die. Um, and that's a big waste of time and then money and everything. Um, so there's, there's definitely some good resources out there that we can uh, talk about for uh, getting to know the right plant for the right place. Um, actually, this, uh, our, our fellow um, East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, who's, who created this awesome little graphic, has a really good website where they have plant profiles that talk about, you know, how big each plant gets and, um, you know, what kind of environment they like. So there's, on the, what, on the internet is just full of really great info. Um, another good resource actually is the Portland Plant List. And it's called the Portland Plant List, of course, because it focuses on plants that grow in the Portland area, but it's generally, those are going to be the same plants that grow anywhere in the Willamette Valley forest area. Um, and that is a very comprehensive resource that lists, you know, plant preferences and sizes and whatnot. Uh, the other main, you know, advice I have for planting is to get really good soil contact for anything, you know, seeds. We found that to be super important for our uh, experimental plots, that soil contact. Um, but same with uh, bare root, you know, planting. Um, and this is a very, a very careful planting um, of a bare root tree. Um, I've you know, we work with contractors who basically also can just like take a shovel, make a little envelope, stick in the bare root uh, roots, and then close that envelope. But the closing of the envelope for the reburying of those roots is the most important part. If you leave big air pockets um, or a crack going all the way down in that 
a root pocket, it's just going to dry out your little shrub and it will die. Um, so that's important. So then where to get these plants is another good question. It really depends on how many you want. Um, if you want just small amounts, like up to 100 or so plants, um, there's lots of native plant sales all over the place. Um, you know, in our area, Scapoose Bay, Skyline, Audubon, the Backyard Habitat Program, um, there's so many. Uh, so, you know, you can look online, contact us or East Multnomah SWCD and we'll give you a big long list. Um, there's also some really good retail native plant nurseries in the area. I just listed a couple there, but there are certainly more. Um, then if you're getting into larger numbers, like you really have a big forest and you need to put in thousands of things and you want hundreds of each species, um, a much more affordable way to go is to get these bare root plants where you get a bundle of 25 to 50 of uh, any particular species. Um, usually these wholesale native plant nurseries require like a minimum um, order amount of you know, they might say like a minimum of 250 or $500 or something, but usually you're getting plants for like about a dollar per plant or maybe even less depending on the size. Um, so way more affordable than like a container where you're buying, you know, an $8 per pot thing and then um, you know just practically you can get more of them out into the forest whereas you can't just haul a ton of pots out to the forest. Um, so I listed you know the the particular nurseries in our area that we kind of go to for these larger orders Shampooey Nursery, Seven Oaks, Trolls Valley, Native Plantscapes, there are more, you know, but this, I, I don't want to make our PowerPoint too busy. And certainly if you're not in the Portland area, you'd want to look for your own um, more local nurseries. So then that was for shrubs and plugs and whatnot. For, um, for herbaceous plants, um, seeds are really hard to get for the understory species. Um, you know, we we got our sort of experimental seed mixes from uh, our partners, basically. Um, they, you know, collected them from their restoration projects. <laughs> um, they're not commercially available, unfortunately. Um, you can get some of the grasses like Columbia Brome, Blue Wild Rye, uh, from the seed companies I listed here. Uh, including Heritage Seedlings, Silver Falls Nursery, Pro Time Lawn has actually a really good mix of natives. And then Johnny Native Seed is kind of a, a specialty like seed collector. Um, so that's kind of a more specialty deal, but um, he can collect understory species. So we have gotten some fringe cup and water leaf that way. But, you know, I think even you know, even if you contact these companies and ask them, hey, do you think you'll ever get water leaf seed? Uh, that might start to plant that seed in them of like, maybe I should grow some water leaf and sell it. Um, otherwise, they don't know that, that that's something people are interested in and why would they make that leap? Um, so I would say, honestly, the best bet for you at this point is to collect from your own woodland or if you have a friend who has a really nice patch of uh, like fringe cup or something, you know, just do your own collecting. It's really fun, actually. <laughs> you just get paper bags at the right time of year, you, you know, just in your like little rounds you do around your forest, just check on things, see like, oh, this one's blooming. Uh, this one's kind of almost going to go to seed and just start collecting them, um, you know, and especially for things like fringe cup where it's a dry seed, all you really have to do is store it uh, dry, dark space, um, or even don't worry about storing it, just take it, put it in a bag, and then walk over to your place you want to seed and seed it in right then. 
because um, basically when those seeds are ready, that's the perfect time to spread them because that plant is throwing its seeds out right then and there. Um, I will say though, um, you know, collect responsibly. So don't take all of the seed of something from a certain place, you know, that plant needs to reproduce in that spot. And especially if you're having invasive weed problems, don't take seed from that area. So I don't want to like belabor all this too much, but I just wanted to throw those ideas in there. So I'm going to give it back to Michael at this point for some other things to do with your forest floor. Well, thank you. Yeah, so that was, um, you know, a big reason why we wanted to give the talk was really to cover those slides that, that Laura just got through and we're excited about learning more and more about a lot of those plants and how they're going to work. Um, so um, I just wanted to do a few quick slides here about just some other things that are important on your forest floor and can sometimes uh, complement your plantings. So just to march through those for a couple minutes, we've got um, you know a photo here on the left of a, tr a tree that has fallen down. And um, this is kind of like an ecologist's dream. It looks like this was a conifer that probably stood for a while and was used by woodpeckers and cavity nesting animals. Um, and now it's fallen down and hopefully you'll have a new life of a couple decades perhaps laying on the ground and being down wood habitat for um, small mammals and amphibians and things like that. The bottom right photo is just kind of another down log deeper in the forest, but um, I like the, this just very simple stump picture on the top right because some of our favorite understory species really like to grow right out of organic material like old stumps and I should have really found a much better stump photo of red huckleberry growing out of it, but I think I just lost my patience and threw this one in here. I'll, I'll make that improvement if we're asked back next year, but um, you know, stumps can just be great habitat for all kinds of things and sometimes certain things uh, will grow out of those. I think... Laura, if you're able to just click it, that might be our safest bet. Cool, thank you. Um, so, you know, down wood is great and it's like the bigger the better. There's all kinds of things that can use it, the bigger and better it gets. So sometimes we're doing these restoration projects, whether we're a conservation district or restoration ecologist working for um, other organizations or a landowner, of course, doing this on their own. And we're generating a bunch of six inch diameter logs. Um, and those are kind of useful, but they're not real big and, um, and great. So sometimes we need to build things with those smaller logs. And so this photo is just kind of some brush piles in the forest and down on the, the one that's on the bottom was an attempt to take a whole bunch of our six inch diameter pieces that were five or six foot in length and just line them all out for about 30 feet and make them taller so it could kind of mimic a larger log. Um, you know, it's never going to be the same as a larger log. It's, this, this pile will rot much differently than a 40 inch diameter tree, but um, it's definitely an effort to try to put a lot of habitat in one place and it'll be fun to kind of watch that over time. We'll go to the next one. I really love this site. It was a conifer release project that we worked on, I think in 2013. And on the day of the thinning where a bunch of alder and cherry were cut, mostly cherry actually to release some cedar and some fir and hemlock, um, we, we did these piles that you see on the left and that's a five foot tall, it's probably like a five foot by five foot by five foot cube of hardwood logs. And as we know, those will decompose a little quicker than a conifer log will. But um, right away as you're walking away with chainsaws still humming 100 feet, 200 feet away, you'll see songbirds start to feed on these piles instantly. And it's really, it's really exciting. And they can be noisy places through, through a lot of the winter and spring. Um, you can see our understory vegetation's creeping up and starting to grow on the pile a few years later. And then these aren't necessarily the, all the exact same pile, but they're all were similar. And the one on the bottom right is about six years old and it's just about like morphed back into the soil. But what's cool if you kneel down next to that one, is there's still room for rodents and amphibians and things to climb under the what's left of that pile and continue to use it. So those are those are really neat things to add. We can go next one, Laura. 
I, I, so on the left, I just have this patch of bare ground, which is, it's not that much bare ground, but you see like a little bit next to the one tree and bare ground's not bad. Um, excuse me if Laura mentioned it and I, and I missed it, but she is definitely on some of the plots seen bees nesting right in that bare ground on some of these, these um, sites. Um, and it's been pretty exciting to find that sometimes, some bumblebees and things like that. So um, bare ground's not all bad. You just may not want 100% of it. Um, and then on the right, you know, this is like one of those little wetlands or pond sort of side channels that you see in forests. And it's funny, I laugh a little bit because it's not uncommon that I go up to one of these with a landowner and they think, should we dig this out and make it a big pond? And I'm like, well, you can, but just this right here is an awesome amphibian nesting habitat. You know, so that's another kind of forest floor feature. And you could even plant the edge of this um, seasonal pond or wetland um, with sedges and things like that that like to be in more wa uh, wet environments. So those are some things to think about to kind of uh, work on your project as you wait for your uh, plants to grow. We can go to the next one. But so um, I just wanted to run through some different management options. So um, you can go to the next one actually already, Laura. Here, I mentioned earlier a, a picture that wasn't quite as dramatic as this one on the left. And I said, you know, that's bare ground. And, you know, a lot of people really want to have things growing there. But it's actually not always that simple. It's not just that, you know, someone forgot to plant this with understory vegetation. That's sometimes it doesn't need to be planted at all. But there's also a lot of places where you could bring any species you wanted planted on the ground and it just might not thrive or even survive at all. And that's a picture on the left of a very, very dense forest where I, I think anything we would have wanted to try to just walk in there and plant would not have made it. The picture on the right is a much older Douglas fir stand. Maybe even could use a thinning. It's, it's kind of dense when you get in there and reduced canopies and things. But it's still, it's just with that height and everything, it's letting a lot of light get in. And that's why that sword fern is doing so well. And if I walked in there and I tried to sneak in some Indian plum or ocean spray and plant that in some places, I bet it would grow pretty well. Maybe kind of slow, but it would, it would come in and it'd be really ready to take over if one of those trees was to die and fall over. Go to the next one, please. So here's another area. Do you just plant this? You know, sometimes you can, but on the left, that's a very dramatic photo of ivy taking over everything. If you look at it, you do see, you might be able to pick out some native shrubs and some sword ferns and things that are growing in there. But I wouldn't really recommend anyone go into a site like that and plant anything. It's probably just going to get kind of swallowed up by the ivy. On the right, I really love this photo for a lot of different presentations because you can see an edge of a project boundary. So on that lower half of the photo, we did not treat ivy there, but the rest of the area kind of going uh, uh, downhill from there was treated really successfully with multiple ivy treatments using herbicide and um, hand cutting it off of trees. And when we came back in, the herbicide that would have been used just by the way would have been triclopyr and glyphosate. And when we came in and planted shrubs in that area and we threw down grass seed, it grew really, really great. And a lot of that was because there's actually enough canopy, enough light coming in through the canopy to get those things to grow. Snowberry is one that's done really, really well on that site. Next one, please. So this is just a quick image to say, you know, even if you just look at like a simple diagram from a silviculture paper or, or textbook, you know, the, that uncut stand doesn't look like a lot of light would get through it. And then it gets thinned, which is an option, and now you can see where just light would come through there. So next slide. This is a, a spot where this picture is taken pretty much in the exact same spot, maybe off by a few feet. But um, in 2012, in that top area, we wanted to thin this forest because it was getting pretty dense. And there really was just besides sword fern, there really wasn't much growing in the understory. If I had to do a percent cover on this stand, I would have probably called it 10% forest floor cover or less. Um, on the bottom photo, that's six years later after thinning and you can see one of our piles there and nothing was actually planted in there. Just the thinning alone let in enough light that the understory really rebounded. I think it's one of the coolest things of the project. I think we're probably getting better growth of our fur, which was a major intent because we gave them some more space to grow. But the, uh, the ferns have come in well and and one thing when you take a photo from this angle is it's really hard to capture trillium and um, fringe cup and all these plants really well, but there's a lot of those in there too. 
So this particular landowner, and Laura, you can go to the next slide. This is the same property. Um, this is a landowner who goes to these native plant sales at the conservation district and goes and buys a few dozen plants and plants them. So, so a few things you would maybe see in the image would be from that planting, but it's really a passive restoration of just the thinning alone did this. So our shade tolerant species can tolerate more shade than your Douglas fir or your oak trees, but it's not that they don't like sun. They definitely need some light in the stand. So we can go to the next one. Um, so here's just a, a one I, caught, I, I borrowed from another kind of silviculture or land management paper where it just shows the idea of sort of a, a variable density thinning. So um, this is often used just as an aside when we want to establish a new cohort or a new age of forest and do uneven aged management and sometimes we're bringing in the same species, just younger, like you might be able to do a two acre gap cut and put in some Douglas fir, maybe you want to do like a five acre gap cut and do Douglas fir or a one acre cut where you're adding cedar or hemlock. But I'm just saying that you can also use this for shrubs if you really wanted to establish some different pollinator habitat in your forest or um, just patches of diversity. Because um, kind of like what Laura has talked about with the um, plots that we've planted, we're, we got to do it kind of on a smaller scale, especially when we're not getting our hands on a lot of seed. Um, and then we hope that they will kind of spread and that sort of deal. So a lot of times with gap cuts, you're going to talk about multiple acre cuts and forest management. But with um, shrub planting, you might consider doing some smaller ones that are just a quarter acre or even an eighth of an acre. Um, and then the bigger that they get, the more you can introduce some of the more sun loving shrubs. But um, small patches would be really great for shade tolerant shrub establishment. And you can go to the next slide, Laura. This is actually a picture I took recently of a quarter acre cut that we did with the woodland owner and it's actually the opposite of what I've been talking about. It's a forest that's almost entirely shrubs. You'd almost argue it wasn't a forest. I think it was just a successional process where trees never established well here, but it's not all invasives either. It was a lot of native shrubs. So what this guy's doing is he's actually doing one of these patch cuts and I just wanted to show it here just kind of see a real photo of a patch cut and he'll actually plant some conifer into that, some, some cedar and hemlock and kind of get see how that does. It's because he wants more conifer in his forest. All right, next one. So this is just uh, one of my last slides, but just in summary, um, just intact understory definitely provides a lot of habitat. Uh, when we do woodland management out of a soil and water conservation district, we're often um, attracting kind of, I guess, a clientele that really wants to talk about wildlife and a lot of different objectives in their forest. And so they really get excited about doing this and we we see more wildlife, you know, in these really diverse areas. Um, there's a lot of species that can be grown in the understory. So Laura mentioned a bunch, but also as one of your resources that will be online after the show here, will be a handout of just a lot of shade tolerant shrubs that we think would grow well in local forests, or we know that they do. And we didn't put anything on that list that we think is like impossible to find at a nursery. Those, the list, you, you might look at it and see, oh, I can't believe they didn't put the certain species in here. Those are all going to be species that you could actually probably find and plant. And pretty much they'll grow well as long as you're not in a zero light situation. Um, they'll grow slow. A lot of our shrubs in shade will grow slow, but they're there when, when they get their chance to thrive. Um, so we do need some sunlight, kind of goes to what I just said. So if you want shrubs, go to your wholesale nursery or your native plant sale. But if you want forbs, it is a little more complicated. The, um, the plugs, like we've talked about, can work well, but right now we're at a point where getting seed is difficult to do for a lot of these species, and it's definitely one of the major goals of the project. And this is not just me and Laura's goal, it's definitely a goal of, um, and you can go to the next slide, this is actually a good segue, it's definitely a goal of our, um, of our partner organization. So again, we really want to thank um, like Toby Query from Bureau of Environmental Services, John Getz at Clean Water Services, at Metro we have um, Marsha Holt Kingsley and um, Adrian Basie and Aaron McElroy, a PSU student, all people that, you know, I wouldn't say we stole a bunch of their ideas. We did borrow them with permission, but we definitely had a chance to get a funding opportunity and use a lot of what they were already doing to, um, to get info out there. So um, with that, I think we should just go for some more questions unless I forgot about a slide. Okay. Perfect. So we got a bunch more. We got eight questions. Some of them kind of go back to some earlier stuff, but some of them are fresh. So I'm just going to take them from the top. 
I mean, this is a long question. And if you guys want to read these, you can open the question box and you guys can read them too. This is one that might help with reading. So on a, by you guys, I mean Michael and, and Laura. I think you all can look at them too. Um, on a very overgrown plot, I have removed most of the invasive plants, replanted a mix of Douglas fir and valley pine in between the planting. I have planted a seed mix of oats, monita, buckwheat, burnet, persist, clover, re clemson, and white, ryegrass, timothy, climax, safe tall fescue, chicory trigger as, as a way to slow the invasive plants. What should I add? Boy, is there room for anything else? So what's he missing? Um, I'd say shrubs would be my answer. Got a really great herbs there. And he's got yeah. good uh, trees, but shrub layer seems to be missing to me. I mean, it does seem like, I mean, that could be a fun, you know, start for things to plant there. Um, I think as tr his trees, or this person, I shouldn't say his, trees get bigger, um, you may lose some of those species that won't do well as with uh, with less sun. And so it, maybe not right now, it might not be the time to add more. It might be better to add more in the future to that site when you start to get more shade. But Laura probably has an even cooler answer. I mean, no, I think that's a good point. I, I had forgotten or I hadn't quite clued in on how this is a very new planting still and probably has a lot of sun. Um, but yeah, I think in the future, once the, the canopy is kind of uh, closed in and then you do like a little uh, thinning to release the competition on the trees, then more shade tolerant things. Um, I tend to like to stick with native plants. Um, I know a lot of those that were listed are not necessarily native, um, just because then they, you know, they're they're really made for those those more natural environments like forests. Um, so you know, any of the things on our plant mix, um, but especially like I say, the the Columbia brome and blue wild rye are things you can actually buy. And those are grasses, but they're native forest grasses. And that's the thing I can think of. Good. So I'm gonna kind of combine these two because they're both uh, about the plots and getting seeds established. So first one is how much time was there between weed removal and planting? And was there any soil amending other than raking? And then the second one is related to it. If you want to seed with natives, would you conclude it's better to pull invasives first or wait till your natives take hold and then pull invasives? So it's kind of the process to get plants going. I'll take a stab at that one. Um, so these, these areas, we definitely want to try to get rid of the, the big invasive plants first because if they're already there, you know, and you put in these little tiny seeds, they're probably not going to do very well. So what we did is we basically tr removed the invasives and then almost immediately within the same year uh, seeded. And I would say that was really successful because even a year later, those sites that we hadn't seeded um, had started to get these annoying little like annual forest weeds that wouldn't they hadn't come in in the places we had seeded so basically seeding prevented that wave of secondary invasion right and how about any soil amendment oh yeah good question no them. soil amendments one thing i think um so you know we we did the raking but then yeah we didn't add any kind of like fertilizer and i would highly uh recommend against that because uh, generally our understory plants are adapted to the levels of nutrients in the forest already and it's the weeds that really love the extra nitrogen and other things like that all right so Nessa, you mentioned blackberries a couple times. So blackberries germinate so readily from seed. Do you notice a significant resurgence of them from seed after you remove the, the big plant, blackberry plants? Uh, yes, <laughs> I would say yes. Um, 
And, you know, we definitely, it, it helps to, especially with Blackberry, I think have a couple passes, you know, where you do a, a major pass to get the big stuff and then you know some of it's going to pop back up so you come back and get that again. Um, but then those little tiny seedlings, I feel like if they have enough competition, they're not going to do as well. They'll still be there. Um, so, of course, you know, it's an ongoing process of always keeping an eye on your forest. I think Michael had some ideas too, though. Yeah, you know, let me add one thing to that. Um, I think, you know, with, with Blackberry, for instance, you just, you always have to kind of keep after that one. Like so many of these weeds, there's a lot of maintenance. And even when you're using herbicides to treat weeds, there's a lot of, um, there's, a, there's a, quite a bit of ability to, to dodge natives and try to just spot spray the invasives and the natives can often be okay. Um, but, you know, to kind of go at these last couple questions, there, there's, there's pl some plots that we did that um, given a different timeline, maybe we would have treated them one more year for weed control. Um, that's one thing is thanks again to the NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant that paid for a lot of this work. But when you're grant funded, you're on timelines that sometimes kind of make you like move a little quicker than you might have. Um, but it is really great to get as, uh, just a really, site prep is so important, whether you're talking about stream restoration on the Tualatin River or um, forest understory work, um, you really, you really want to get a pretty clean slate before you get started. All right. So we're going to move into overtime. Um, it's uh, 4.30 and I know some people need to leave promptly at 4.30. So what I'd like you to do, Laura, if you go to the, the next slide and I want to promote um, next week's programs. And then I'm also going to put up the poll. So if, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, we have a couple of really good ones next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Um, Casey Clapp and uh, Daniel Gleason. Um, both with the city of Portland are going to be here talking about pruning and uh, John Souter with OSU is going to talk about riparian restoration and I'm going to go ahead and put up the poll for you guys to um, give us some results on and uh, I just want to mention as I share as I relaunch this poll um, the last question was put in by uh, Michael and Laura, and I, I have a typo in it that it wouldn't let me fix since we were during the webinar. But when you look at question number four, it talks about all the things you're going to do. One of them is can plant container forms or wildlife, aka pugs. This is really aka plugs. We're not planting dogs, we're planting containerized seedlings. So anyway, if you guys can answer the, the poll questions, and that helps us plan for the future. And we'll leave this up, and I will get back to the questions. Uh, only have six left, but y'all can continue to ask them. These are great. So this one is a question, is there a planting resource for native plant guilds to plant together, much like we do in regenerative horticulture, permaculture, um, where people could like kind of like a common garden kind of thing. You guys know of anything like that? I mean, I would say that there, there are kind of known like forest community guilds and um, there are I think there are certain I feel like there's a forest service document that really lists those well so you can definitely look into that and I think it's a good idea to kind of choose species that way be, and you know try to match them to your forest type because you'll probably have better success that way. Good. Yeah, I was thinking about a Forest Service document I've seen in the past that talks about how different things grow together in different forests around the Willamette Valley or Coast Range, but I can't at all remember the name of it. But just one kind of plug for our services is um, even if your local conservation district doesn't have anybody with the word forest in their title, like I luckily get to have in mine, it's really common that you could talk to a resource conservationist of some kind at your local SWCD, or even a lot of times your stewardship forester will know a good bit about this too, um, from, which is an Oregon Department of Forestry staff person. They can come out and probably tell you kind of what things they see together in the area and give you some feedback on that. Yeah. So one of the resources from the Forest Service is plant association guides. 
And there was one right. that was developed by Fred Hall for all of West Side Region 6. And this has got, you know, it says, you know, Douglas fir snowberry, what are you going to find growing in a Douglas fir snowberry type? So that's, that's a really good one. It may not have all the information, but that's, that's a good, great question. So this next one is, how does transplanting established shrubs from one dense area of forest to another work? You know, rather than buying them, just move the ones you got around. Well, I would say, um, so I have had some experience with transplanting native shrubs like this, and it works better for some than others. Um, and actually, I would say, don't go for your most uh, mature shrubs actually because those have a hard time transplanting because you there's no way you can get their full root system or even uh, enough of it for them to survive so go for you know if you see little immature shrubs um, you can easily dig those up um, and definitely do it in that winter time so then you gotta kind of get to know the the way they look in the winter without leaves or kind of tag them when they do have leaves and then go back later. Um, but yeah, go for some immature ones and try to go for shrubs that don't necessarily grow with um, like really extensive tap roots because um, those are harder to really get the right root. So one area I've had luck with this for both trees and shrubs is on cut banks. Um, they'll seed in because you've got bare soil and, and you can dig them in the morning and plant them in the afternoon. That works pretty well. But again, we got to be little guys. Mm -hmm. So here's a question about down logs, Michael. If I leave down logs, am I encouraging invasive bugs? In some cases, you could be, and sometimes that'll depend on what species it is and what size it is. I think that, um, you know, one thing, and I asked this question of entomologists at ODF or even uh, Glenn Kohler up at Washington DNR, like, I was like, I do these Douglas fir thinning projects where there's these seven and eight inch trees that are getting cut and being left in the woods on these steep hills. And they've often said, you know, with Douglas fir beetle, I wouldn't worry that much about that because they're usually more interested in larger trees. And so I think when you're doing restoration level, you know, thinning that's like taking out small stuff or non-commercial work, you're probably in a lot of cases okay. I would never give out a blanket, always okay statement. Um, and then also I think if you've got a couple of trees that fell down, um, they, uh, they're probably fine. It's just if you had a windstorm where most of your trees fell down, then you probably want to salvage and get a lot of stuff off of site. So there could be too much of a good thing. Another thing too is if you know that it was infested with a certain pest insect that led to its demise and then it fell down, you'd be more likely to say, let's get this out of here because that's, that's bringing bad things. One example where it is a problem is with pine. Um, the Ips beetle can move into a thinning slash and really the key is the time of the year. So if you do it in the fall, it's not a problem. If you thin in the spring, it, it can be a real problem. So that's one I would watch, but you know, there's not that much ponderosa pine around, but a lot of it that, that is around does need thinning. So mm -hmm. that's a good one. So this is a really interesting question. And it's, I think this is the stump the host question. So I hope you guys are reading this one too. Is there any research on using Hugel culture methods for starting native plant understory plants? Hugel culture, do you guys know what that is? I don't know what it is. All right, you not only stump the host, you stump the presenter. So you get a gold star for that question, anonymous. Um, now you know why they ask it anonymously. Okay, so this is, a, uh, I think is an easier one. This is really just about the terminology that you guys are using. Shrubs, bushes, forbs, pollinators. What are these things? Um, what's the difference between all these things? I, I'll take a stab at that. So um, if you're, talking about shrubs, bushes, forbs, and pollinators, and shrubs and bushes are probably going to be the same thing. And we often define shrubs as being, you know, not as tall as what we call trees, or they're often multi-stemmed and things like that. Um, and so there's certain trees out there, like sometimes cascara can be called a shrub or a tree or elderberry is kind of like that. Forbs are going to be much more, that's usually something where you are using that term for an herbaceous plant that is not a grass. So it's often a broadleaf wildflower. Um, 
it's not a fern, ferns are different. Um, and then the word pollinators, we often talk about pollinators or pollinator plants, but pollinators are gonna be bees and butterflies mostly, although you know some bats and part of the world can be pollinators and birds and things. But like when you hear Laura or I on a future presentation talking pollinators, we're probably talking bees. Um, and, and then pollinator plants are those that those bees like to visit. Excellent. So a couple more. Um, this one's very specific. I found a long grass with a green burr on the end that turns into small white fluffs like a dandelion growing in my pond. I have looked through all my books and can't find what it is. Any ideas? Long grass with a green, green blur that turns into like down. I, I do, um, that does ring a bell, but I, I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but that's, it's not actually a grass. Um, it's probably something unique, but if you, I think maybe we have our email addresses available. Mm -hmm. The best thing that's to do would be like, Email to the slide before I think it had them on there. Oh, you know, I don't think it did, but we may have forgot yeah. to put them on. But you can find us at west wmswcd.org for sure. Yeah. And if you don't get Laura, I'll just kind of you can also ask Master Gardener sometimes that question mm -hmm. from OSU Extension and they can help you out as well. Good. Yeah, email us pictures if you can. That's you gotta send photos. Yep. <laughs> So the last person said, um, Laura mentioned a list of native shrubs. Please put the list on the screen. And I can do that. If you stop sharing, Laura, I can share okay. mine. I have it all set up, ready to go. There we go. So here is the list. And this is on your resource. A um, couple different resources are there. And this is the list they have of understory plants. And on the left are shrubs that can be purchased as bare root or containers. The center one are forbs or wildflowers that can be purchased as plugs, not pugs. And then on the far right are grasses, sedges, and ferns. And, and these are all available locally at the kind of nurseries that uh, we talked about. So I think that exhausts the questions. You guys did fantastic. And I thank the participants for hanging in there. I thank uh, Laura and Michael for a great show. And I learned a ton. Um, I'm hoping to be uh, a woodland owner when I retire, and believe me, this is the kind of information I'm going to be using. So thank you all. Thanks for joining us. Join us again next week, and we have two different ones that will be very good, and I know you will enjoy it. So goodbye to everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks for having us and all the hard work you put into it. All right. Indeed. Thanks, everyone.